Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Black History Month is only just around the corner, and to usher it in, I have a really exciting guest for you today, Dr. Andre Archie, who is an associate professor of ancient Greek philosophy at Colorado State University. Today, we're here to talk about his latest book, The Virtue of Colorblindness, which defends the need for a colorblind society, although what with our shared background in classics, I can't promise that we're not going to get into a little bit of the ancient Greeks as well. So with no further ado, I really hope you enjoy. Dr. Archie, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to discuss my book and some other things. Yeah. Um, so kicking us off with the book, um, it's called The Virtue of Colorblindness. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is, I mean, not that there's not new content in the book, but at least the title is something that was sort of established knowledge, let's say, right. 20, 25 years ago. Um, so I'm wondering what led you to write it? Did you have any personal experiences that kind of spurred you on to this topic? Or is it just sort of a response to the political zeitgeist right now? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I've been teaching for nearly, what, 25 years. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I always tell my students that the ancient Greeks, ancient Greek philosophy, the Western philosophical tradition is very relevant. And it's relevant in a way that helps orient how we understand issues, how we discuss issues. And as a Black American, I've been plugged into a lot of this, the discussions regarding race. And I've always felt as if the Greeks had some things to say about the issue of identity as it relates to race. Now, of course, the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, uh, they don't discuss race the way we do. I mean, that, that, that would be very anachronistic. But they do talk about culture. They talk about identity in a way that I think is very helpful. So I thought that it would be useful um, for myself, for my students, but for the public square to engage in the topic, on the topic of race uh, from sort of a, a, mm. a classics perspective. And so that's what I tried to do. And of course, virtue, I'm, I'm grounding that discussion in Aristotle's Nicomachean ethics. So essentially a certain type of excellence, but I try to connect that excellence with character. And so the idea of colorblindness is intimately entailed uh, with uh, character. And so all of that, I try to get, I try to get into in a way that makes it accessible and uh, relevant and tries to provide another alternative uh, to the one that's uh, really dominant in the public square today regarding race. All right. Well, I promised myself I wouldn't do this and that I would go straight in with the political stuff, but you (laughs) put too much on the table and I'm sorry, the listeners are going to have to wait. We're going to start with classics. (laughs) Fair enough. Um, But so, I mean, I'm very interested in the way that you discuss this. I mean, especially kind of within classics, it's a field that's, as I'm sure you've been following, undergone a lot of revision recently because of these topics. And I guess just to start kind of with the most basic question, I mean, your stance in the book seems to be more along the lines of colorblindness is an ancient virtue. And... I, I, I can kind of see both sides, to be honest with you, because on the one hand, it's just a totally different world from the world that we have in America, mm-hmm. which has the legacy of like a particular kind of slavery that was specifically about African-Americans. But at the same time, the ancients definitely saw race. I mean, I, I was working on a project on Virgil a couple months ago, and when he says such a great effort it was to found the Roman race, the Gens, I just, I mean, you can translate it some way other than race, but to say that it's like a totally different concept, I don't know. So why do you think that it's worthwhile to turn to the ancients when we talk about what race is and, and does it exist? 
Right. So I, I would I would say that the Greeks. I'm not as familiar with the Romans. I, I know a bit about uh, 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 the Romans, uh, but slavery, as you know, was yeah. was a widespread institution yeah. in both ancient civilizations, but it was never color right. based. And so that's my orientation. That's my um, that's my take on, especially ancient Greek philosophy. Of course, we have the natural slave in Aristotle. But Aristotle never, mm. never equates dark skin, and and they were dealing with the Ethiopians, right, as right. A, as as a, right. as a culture, and so they had contact, and so, uh, and this is pointed out by Edward Snowden, um, a classics professor. He's no longer with us, but he taught at uh, Howard for a number of years. Mm. But he he decisively, I think, argues, uh, and Lefkowitz as well. She's uh, she's mm. a retired professor. I think she taught at uh, Smith. Uh, I might be confusing which 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 university, but um, they both argue that, especially the ancient Greeks, didn't attach race um, to slavery. I mean, it had a lot to do with reason, or at least the assumption regarding different people's conceptions uh, and how they exercise reason. And so, mm-hmm. in that respect, I'm 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 aiming at that sort of uh, uh, tradition there. Um, and so what, what, what becomes important, what becomes important is character um, in terms of how we display our capabilities or at least exercise our capabilities. And so, of course, the, the and I think it's a lot of the translations that we, we deal yeah. with, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, especially as it relates to the ancients. But I do not think, and I, and I, and I think there's evidence out there uh, to suggest that the ancient Greeks in particular, um, because that's my specialty. Hmm. They didn't equate color with any sort of moral merit or uh, uh, the lack of color at, at, hmm. as a type of uh, 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 lack of moral merit or or moral merit. Whereas we, today we might say, you know, victims for for the most part of structural racism are people of color, blacks in particular, and then uh, the victimizers tend to be white. So. We've we've radically changed our focus in terms of the ancient world world as it relates to a certain ascriptive mm. characteristics that we that 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 we have that are not essential to who we are as as moral agents or at least that's my thesis in the book and mm. so in that respect I'm not arguing that the Greeks or the Romans uh, were not conscious of different civilizations and their the color of their peoples but. Mm. It, it there wasn't a, an, a moral quality that was attached um, to skin color in the way that we get with the Enlightenment. And so that's why I think the Greeks are so significant for me, uh, especially the discussion of, of character as, as the, the, the locus of moral agency. And that's really the basis of the book as it, as it relates to colorblindness. Well, so dig a little bit more into that. I mean, you're using the word character, which is the same word that Martin Luther King Jr. uses. How do you see the connection from that, which is recent, all the way back to the Greeks? Yeah, so so all the way back to the Greeks. So again, I'm focusing on eudaimonia, Aristotle, mm. and specifically his his concept of character or specifically hexis. And so I don't get into the the weeds too much in the book in terms yeah, of yeah. that sort of uh, theoretical model, uh, that ethical theoretical model. But what I try to do is to focus on the the through line, and so the through line really for me on our shores begin with our founding documents, mm. and those founding documents speak to an idea that is appreciated very much by Frederick Douglass. Yeah. Because for him, that second paragraph in particular of the Declaration really speaks volumes about our capabilities and capacities as human beings. And so I say Douglass really anticipates many of the themes that we get with Martin Luther King Jr. But taken all of that, we can't have any of those individuals and the significance that that they have for us as Americans until we appreciate the Western philosophical tradition in which those principles are uh, uh, embodied. And so 
the through line really begins with that Western philosophical tradition. I, I start with Aristotle. Mm. I talk about Cicero and some other classical thinkers. But it's really, again, uh, the anchoring of one's moral capabilities in character formation. Through that, I take it up to Frederick Douglass and then uh, Martin Luther King. But the connection there is clear to me. And when we look specifically at the chapter on Douglas that I that I that I write about, um, we see through the Colombian orator how he was influenced as a young boy by these classical writings. And to me, that says so much in terms of pushing back against those who argue, like Ibram X. Kendi, that mm-hmm. the Western philosophical tradition. Uh, does not, cannot speak to people of color, Black Americans in particular. It's just not the case because we have a track record in which those founding principles, the Western philosophical t- tradition, they've been instrumental in the fight for uh, being treated equal before the law, not just in terms of people of color, Black Americans, but in terms of women, in terms of other groups that have been uh, historically marginalized. And so I think we need a narrative in my book. I argue this. We need a narrative to counter uh, the narrative of divisiveness that we get with people like Coates, uh, uh, Kindy, uh, D'Angelo. And I think up to this point, we haven't really made an effort to do that yeah. um, uh, because what predominates in the public square today uh, is, is a narrative and narratives that are racially uh, uh, um, poisonous in a way that I haven't seen uh, in my lifetime. Uh, we were on a trajectory of, of at least aspirationally getting to this colorblind um, orientation and engagement with each other. And I think, you know, there's a lot of issues that we can get into, but really with the death of George Floyd, I think it supercharged um, a lot of those uh, racial ideologies. And, and that's what predominates in the public square today, the university's primary, secondary level uh, of education post-secondary. And, and it's a and it's problematic. I want to put a pin in Frederick Douglass, but to kind of cut to the chase in this interview, um, you say it starts with George Floyd, but even when I was, you know, an undergraduate in my sophomore great books course, everyone went around the room and said a figure they admired, and no one listed MLK quite a lot of people listed Malcolm X. So even back, that would have been 2018 or 19. um, I think the MLK style of racial politics was already a little bit old fashioned, maybe Mm -hmm. not quite as hated as it is now, but Mm -hmm. definitely like distinctly of a previous generation. And so I kind of wonder, I mean, from your perspective, how do you get between that MLK and kind of the current iteration of racial politics. And because you're a classicist, I can ask you, what, what's the peripatia? What, what's the point <laughs> where there's where there's no return, where suddenly things have kind of shifted radically? Because there definitely is a an instinct, I think, on both the right and the left to say it's a straight line. And starting with the civil rights movement, this is where we were going to end up. Yeah, that's that's a, that's a very insightful question. Um, a lot of people don't realize, and, and I mentioned George Floyd, Uh, only because I think that things uh, became really supercharged racially with that. You know, of course, we had Ferguson. Really, it begins with multiculturalism in the early 90s. But I can get to all of that. But I think that what's significant about the question that you asked, or at least what it raises, is the idea that in the Black community, these discussions of separatism uh, versus assimilation uh, they've been around for a long time. This is nothing new. So what Kindy's proposing, uh, what uh, Coates is proposing, what Derek Bell proposed in terms of critical race theory, uh, those ideas were floating around the Black community for, for literally hundreds of years, early 19th century. And so you think of Alexander Cromel, he thought Black should immigrate. And so you had these, and he was a contemporary of Douglas. And so they were friends, but Douglas would have these heated debates with these various uh, black scholars about whether or not black Americans should 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 flee America because there was no way they could be treated equally before the law. 
And you had those like Douglas who argued, well, wait a minute, this country is, is, is ours, is ours. We're expanding the conception of freedom, but we have to remind our fellow white Americans that they have to stay true to our founding principles. And so, as you know, originally Douglas wasn't on the side of those who wanted to stay. Uh, he too was quite pessimistic about the prospects of black Americans in, in, in America. But over time he realized that there was something special in those founding documents that applied to him as a human being. So if we fast forward a bit and we take all of that history in mind in the debates that happened in the black community in the past, I think what the difference is, is that the voices that argue for separateness or this divisiveness have influence, have power, or they call them allies, right? That's what Kindy likes to call them. And so I think we've raised those voices up to the point that they predominate in the public square in a way that they never have. They've always been a part of the Black community. They've always been uh, sort of a, a fringe element uh, within certain uh, uh, communities in, in Black America. But with several racial events that I mentioned, uh, I think O.J. Simpson was one, but there are lots of others. I think those voices have been raised. And so the issue of white liberals become very significant because I do think in a sense with legacy media, with a lot of white liberals, they've raised those voices in the black community that are the, that are the most divisive. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, blacks are passive and, um, you know, they have no agency. I argue just the opposite. But I do think with certain voices in the wider community, white liberals in particular, uh, certain voices in the black community uh, get heard in a way that they've never have before. Uh, and I think that is ultimately what, what we're seeing today. Um, I mean, look at Kindy. I mean, um, and what's happening at uh, like Boston University and, and, and his institute and, and all the money that uh, he received and can't be accounted for. I mean, uh, that's unheard of. And so uh, I do think there are some other factors that have contributed to our racial politics. Um, but again, that discussion has been taking place for, for, for years within the black community, but it, but it's not inevitable that we can, we, we continue uh, in this direction. I think there, there are voices starting to push back and we're starting to get uh, other, other narratives in the public mm. square. So then do you see this kind of straightforwardly as a continuation of the debate of, you know, separatism versus integration. Am I understanding that correctly? These recent trends. Exactly, and and you mentioned uh, originally your question uh, was uh, when you were. I think you said when you were a sophomore, or freshman, or yeah, sophomore. Uh, great books core. <laughs> great books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the the politics of respectability, right? That that's what they say about that generation, Martin Luther King, right? We've moved past that. It's passe. We need other means of fighting for racial equality. Um, I find that to be silly. Um, the politics of respectability, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that fathers stay in the home? Does that mean that we have intact families? Does that mean that merit applies to Black Americans? Well, if, if it means that, if the, if, if the politics of respectability means that, I, I want that. And in fact, I argue uh, for that in my book. And so people like Kindy want to argue that objectivity, merit, uh, these sort of white structures do not apply to Black Americans. And when it comes to the family, that's been the most sad, the most uh, unfortunate occurrence because you have people, academics, arguing that single parent families mainly mothers, black mothers, uh, are just as legitimate as two parent families, a mother and a father. And that's done a lot of damage to the black community. And I think black Americans recognize that, but we get these academics, a lot of them well-known, and even people like Kindy and his supporters who argue that the nuclear family's a, a white construct. But if you just look at the, the evidence empirically, two thirds of black children are born to uh, uh, single moms. And so, you know, the arguments that they're making in terms of different family formations uh, are not 
justified by the empirical evidence because we have a lot of brokenness, a lot of broken homes within uh, communities of color, especially um, the African-American community. I mean, the the role that white people or white liberals, but maybe we'll just say white people writ large, have kind of played on both the left and the right when you talk about racial politics is very interesting to me. And I'm very interested in the way that you've addressed it. I mean, I kind of wonder, I think the left has really kind of carved out these very specific roles where they're like, black people do this and white people do this. White people are allies in this way. And then there's kind of a tendency among black conservatives to say a lot of this has been set up by white liberals. Um, And not that white liberals, I mean, Robin DiAngelo is white, let's be clear. (laughs) So it's not like they've been totally silent on these issues. But I mean, I kind of wonder how you view the interplay between those two groups, between the black community writ large and white liberals. Are there specific ways that you think white liberals or white people have been stoking tensions or ways in which you think white people can be better about it? Yeah, yeah, that's a very thoughtful uh, uh, comment. Um, I do think that there's been a fraught history, um, at at least for black conservatives, when it comes to white liberals. And so when you think about William Lloyd Garrison and his relationship with with Douglas. I don't get in this too into into this too much, but you know there was a lot of uh, uh, condescension there. I mean, at least when when Douglas started evolving towards accepting America and its founding principles as something good. Um, but you get those sort of relationships within the black community uh, vis a vis uh, white liberals now. You know, I don't like generalizing. It's difficult to do so. I mean, things are complex. But I do think that a certain type of white liberal uh, seems to be prone to exacerbating um, the worst fears that some blacks have about America and other white mm. people. And I think that that's done for a number of reasons. But I think it's it's detrimental, especially when they argue as someone like David Brooks, I mean, I, I point out in the book that, you know, he was a very uh, a vocal advocate of Coates uh, mm. uh, between the world yeah. and me uh, that when, when that was released, he said, you know, this is this is the sort of education that white people need, et cetera, et cetera. But if you read that book closely, Coates's, Coates's book, it, 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 it's racist. <laughs> I mean, it's clearly anti-white. Yeah. And it's not clear to me if, if Brooks... If he was aware of that, um, or he felt as if what was being communicated uh, superseded, you know, um, um, everything else, it, it was just confusing to me why he would endorse such a book. But I do think that this whole idea of allyship um, does put us in boxes, and I think that when it comes mm. to DEI. It's very clear that you know white people should should be quiet. They should be allies, and black people should speak up. They have voices. Those voices have been um, um, restricted for 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 a long time, um, and it's time for the rules to reverse. But I think in doing all of that, it's made things worse. So yes, I do think that there there's a dynamic there that conservatives see. Um, that white liberals see. And I think, and this is what I argue in my book, I think that there's a way out of that hmm. if we if we privilege, if you will, the American identity as opposed to these particularities that define us as yeah. groups. And, and that's what I, I try to promote um, because I think that's the only way that we could possibly survive as a country with, 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 with the sheer diversity that defines us as Americans. Uh, I don't think there's any other way. I think uh, Kindy's way does not work. It creates resentment. Um, I think the aspirational idea of colorblindness is the only way forward. We can celebrate differences Hmm. within the context of something larger and something more unifying. And that's our collective identity, which, which Lincoln talks about, um, um, 
you know, in the Gettysburg Address, you know, we have this new birth of freedom, which is a type of constitutionalism, you know, equal before the law, um, private property, um, the sorts of things that we associate with America, at least post 1863, and that we're still trying to approximate and to realize. Um, but not just that, you know, we have cultural traditions, not just a creedal tradition, but we have a, we have cultural traditions which can ground us uh, as Americans and, and put us on the same page. And that's what I'm trying to promote uh, in the book. Hopefully that's clear in the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, Lincoln, I mean, talk about someone who it feels like I blinked and it was Lincoln freed the slaves to we're removing Lincoln's name from buildings. But I'm wondering, I mean, you have a whole chapter on this thinker who I didn't know very much about, despite kind of having at least somewhat followed this issue, Derek Bell. Yes. Um, and it seems like you've, I think you've sort of mentioned him already in this conversation, but I think it would be really interesting for the listeners if you talked about him a little bit more because he's not so well known and it seems pretty key. And in particular, there's one quote about him that kind of stuck with me. You said, Bell attempts to provoke racial awareness in his readers, but African-Americans are portrayed as too dumb to recognize that they'll always be under the thumb of white people. And to me, that seemed just so classic Marxism. It's like what Marx says about religion, that maybe people, you know, people just are sort of too silly to realize what's really going on. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. Yes. Uh, so, so Derek Bell, uh, very interesting, uh, Presbyterian, born in Pittsburgh, um, I think, what, 1958. Uh, he was the youngest uh, African-American um, professor at Harvard Law, if I'm not mistaken, 1971. Um, and he was, up to a certain point, it was sort of a traditional civil rights uh, lawyer. Uh, he was very influenced by Thurgood Marshall. And somewhere along the way, he said he realized that all of the legislation, all of the supposed advances that Black Americans have made in terms of being treated equal before the law is a sham. And he has this theory called um, interest convergence. And so I'm not sure if it's a theory so much, but it's the idea that the only way that Black Americans can advance is if both middle class and upper class and working class white Americans um, approve. Meaning if, if their interests are served by black interest and in their advancement, then that advancement can, that advancement can proceed. And so he applies this to the Brown versus board of education decision. He says, well, that was only decided the way it was because the upper class found it useful um, for Black Americans to at least think that they're being treated equal before the law. Things are changing, that they will be taken seriously as Americans. They will not be treated as second-class citizens. And he says, Derek Bell says, and this idea of critical race theory argues that, well, these sorts of decisions, outlawing segregation in school, segregation in American society, uh, was was for the sake, at least for Brown versus Board of Education. Third world countries were emerging from colonialism, and we needed to portray our democratic republic as being equal, right? That we treated others equally. Um, and that decision really uh, helped our reputation uh, in the world because we were fighting between democratic republicanism and communism. And so if, if, if the world could see that we're treating our black citizens equal, um, then perhaps that'll make the case for uh, our version of, of democracy. And he says, that's the only reason. And, and this, he says, this is the case for many other supposed advances. Only if white people benefit can, will it be possible for black Americans to benefit, right? They have to see, white people have to see that their, their interest uh, sort of coincides with with black advancement, and so that's a very pessimistic, skeptical take on race relations. And so, but that's part and parcel of the the assumption, the presupposition of critical race theory, uh, which Derek Bell is the father of. That race is um, 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 it's natural. 
right? We naturally see each other in sort of this antagonistic way. And that America is clearly systemically racist. And that when we talk about objectivity and merit, all of that is used to disguise white power. And that it doesn't make sense to apply those same standards to black Americans because black Americans will all always end up with the short end of the stick. So he, he promotes uh, a type of positive discrimination. Um, but ultimately what he concludes is that, you know, we need to imagine black Americans like Sisyphus, right? Uh, uh, the Greek character Sisyphus rolling the boulder up the hill, it rolls down, but, but, you know, he does that for eternity. And so we need to imagine black Americans in this position. And so they're courageous. Um, they, they're clear eyed about their position, right? They're at the bottom of the well. That's the title of one of his books. And so we just have to accept our, our, um, our position and that we have to be courageous in the way that Sisyphus was courageous in terms of rolling this boulder up uh, the mountain and it rolls back down again. So he had a very sort of tragic conception of what it is to be a black American. Uh, because things will never change. And, and those who are naive, perhaps like myself, um, uh, think that things will change. But in fact, uh, it's not the case. And so uh, he, he sort of uh, was quite disdainful of those who, who disagreed with him about the position of Black Americans. Yeah, well, and I mean, the Sisyphus myth, the, the personal agency issue. I mean, that's to me what's kind of sad about it is it's not so much a matter of well, will society change? But it's a matter of, can I change myself? Like, is my own education, my own kind of path in life within my grasp? Um, I mean, it sort of makes sense to me as you're describing that, why you go back to kind of the Greek model, because Aristotle is so much more positive um, about politics, that politics isn't just about power um, than, you know, many other traditions. I mean, famously Machiavelli, but many others. Exactly. And, 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 you know, even when you think about Aristotle and that tradition of eudaimonia, Plato, Socrates, um, it was more, it, it was more forgiving, let's say, than what comes after uh, sort of this Christian conception of original sin. I mean, it was more difficult to sort of overcome and express agency. Um, and there's all sorts of issues related to that. But I try to emphasize uh, to my students that, you know, the Greeks had issues, but in terms of personal agency, um, they were quite optimistic because it was character that we can help form. And it was through character uh, that we can habituate ourselves because they didn't have uh, sort of the metaphysical conception of free will. Um, right. um, and so it was through habituation, through character. And I think that connects nicely with personal agency as we see it in Douglas. And he talks about liberty. Douglas talks about liberty. Uh, and then, of course, that gets channeled through uh, MLK. Um, but this pessimism that we get with Derek Bell is quite psychologically abusive, because if you tell young people, young people of color, that the system is stacked against them, uh, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? And so it's not just sort of material gain that um, becomes suspect, um, uh, but it's psychological once flourishing, right? That that becomes mm. a compromise because, you know, it's like, why bother? Um, uh, or, or they engage in, in uh, behavior that can be destructive. Or, um, and so, yeah, I, I think the pessimism is very, um, it, it needs to be confronted head on. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> there's just an entire buffet of current events examples that you can talk about this concept with. I mean, you've already brought up um, Ibram X. Kendi um, and all of the drama at yep. uh, Boston University. Um, but we even have the updated version of that, which is Claudine Gay at Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wonder, you know, when you talk about the idea of the system being stacked against you, it seemed to me like that was really kind of forefront in the defense launched of Ibram X. Kendi and Claudine Gay. I mean, I wonder when you look at the way that the cookie has crumbled mm -hmm. in both of these instances, do they make you feel more optimistic about the way that it's headed, the kind of response? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, it's positive. I mean, um, I'm not sure what took so long to... <laughs> <laughs> for, for her to lose her job, but um, 
you know, it, 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 eventually it happened. And, you know, there's some other developments, um, you know, in Wisconsin. Um, I don't know if you, you know, their, their legislator um, or legislative body uh, recently curtailed a lot of the DEI practices at Madison. Mm. Uh, but the whole Harvard issue speaks yeah. to that in a way that suggests perhaps people are, are starting to see um the end result of these policies and practices of DEI and anti-racism. I think people are starting to, to wake up. Now, what, what's interesting about Harvard is it's so, I don't know, it's so insular. It, it's hard to know if, if, if they've learned anything. Um, I think it's more about reputation and, and the fact that, you know, they needed to get rid of uh, uh, gay right away. Uh, or at least ultimately, uh, because it's affecting their reputation and their right. fundraising. Um, but I do think if she had been white, she would have been she would have been out of there much quicker. Yeah. Um, oh, hundred percent. Yeah. So, uh, but I think I think those developments are positive. Um, I'm not sure if I, you know, uh, uh, I like Rufo. Um, you know, uh, then you have Ackman. Um, you know, they're doing some things sort of externally uh, that could be helpful. But I think ultimately to change the culture of universities, you have to change how faculty get hired. It, it, it's sort of a process that is very insular and that it sort of reproduces itself. And so until we can figure out a way uh, to interrupt that process, um, I think we'll continue to see faculty drifting even further uh, left, uh, at least in some places. Um, and so much, I mean, not just in academy, but in hiring generally, I mean, diversity training, diversity statements are becoming an increasingly central part of all of those processes. I personally have only had to go through diversity training once, but I assume there's more to come. <laughs> um, <laughs> um you know, for people who are confronted with, you know, diversity training or having to write diversity statements, I mean, what are some things that they should be aware of, that they should be watching out for, um, or ways that they should comport themselves in that situation or address it? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I get asked this, um, you know, by students, by um, by master's students, you know, they're, they're going to go on and get a PhD, uh, Colorado State University, we, we have a terminal master's. Um, and so they're, they're wondering, you know, should they speak up? I mean, you know, so far in my department, I can say positively that uh, we haven't, it's, it's not mandatory that we have these diversity statements. Now it's been talked about, I know it's in other departments uh, at our, at my university, um, but I've pushed back a bit uh, against uh, requiring these things, both for faculty and for 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 students. And I, as you know, I've written a little bit about it in the book. Um, I don't think it's constitutional. I think we're going to start seeing lawsuits challenging uh, diversity statements. And I think, at least from what I've read, some universities are starting to pull back. As I mentioned, uh, Madison, uh, Madison. Uh, for, for undergraduates, I think for graduates as well, there's no diversity statements required. So I think that for students who are opposed to it, and I, I'm opposed to it, um, they need to speak up and say that they're opposed to it uh, on a number of grounds. Um, it doesn't mean that you're against diversity, but it means the type of diversity that they talk about is certainly not the intellectual diversity that uh, the university, that colleges are known for, at least historically. So I think there's there's lots of room to push back against um, these developments. Again, I do think these developments are starting uh, to fade, or at least they're being questioned. And so I think that's a that's a good development, a very good development. Um, what other advice could I give? Um, or things to just sort of watch out for, you know, when you're going th through that, because sometimes you know, you're in the room, you have to be, you have no choice. What are some things that you should just sort of be aware of or register or be on the lookout for people to say? Yeah, I, I think um, it's difficult because I tend to speak up right away. <laughs> and um, for, for some students or faculty, 
it, it can compromise maybe certain positions they're going for or certain promotions, et cetera. Uh, that's difficult because, I mean, you know, I can, it's easy for me to tell someone to speak up and um, whatever happens, happens, you know, the truth is what matters. And, and we know that's not the case. Um, Socrates teaches us that. Um, but I do think we should be aware of being smart. I think we should, we shouldn't be untruthful, but we should pick our moments. We should pick our battles. Um, we should at least try to time it in a way that makes it effective, or at least us speaking up versus, you know, throwing uh, the baby out with the bathwater. I think that there's a way to be smart about these things. And, you know, Harvey Mansfield, I remember years ago, he wrote a piece or maybe I heard him speak speak, but he was talking about, you know, once you get tenure as a professor, you know, you can speak up, right? You can speak up. I mean, you know, you know, I, I assume that within reason, I mean, we're not going to say crazy stuff, but you're going to, you're going to speak up in a way that perhaps you wouldn't have prior to getting tenure. Um, and so I'd say, likewise, there's sort of a political balance. We have to be smart about uh, pushing back against some of these ways of thinking. And so I would just advise folks to be attuned to the political environment, not to stifle yourself, but to figure out when's the best time to speak up, when's the when's a good time to push back, uh, to be politically astute about uh, uh, the situation. Because, of course, um, you know, we're all professionals and we all want to do well. Uh, and there are factors out there who will hold that against us, which is unfair. Clearly, um, but until you know these institutions are in, in our hands, um, I think we have to be smart about navigating some of these uh, politically fraught issues. Mm. I don't know if that that helps, but <laughs> no, very interesting. Uh, so we're sort of getting towards the end of our time here, and I wanted to end on kind of a happier note um, and talk about. I mean, I said that we'd put a pin in Frederick Douglass. So we're finally coming back uh, because one of the sort of amazing things about him is that he educated himself yep. um, and was self-taught. And especially as a classicist, I mean, I'm sure you have a great appreciation for all the ways in which the Western tradition and the classics have influenced a lot of really great black thinkers. And there is kind of a push right now to say, oh, well, the African-American tradition is a separate thing. It's not part of the West. Um, I guess my bias is if it's not part of the West, you know, what is it? Uh, because right. Af Black people have been in the Americas for a really long time. Um, but I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to that, talk about some of the ways that um, both the Western tradition has influenced the Black tradition and the ways in which the Black tradition has kind of been a productive and fruitful part of the Western tradition? Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that question. Um, a couple of years back for National Review, I wrote a piece critiquing, I think his name is Peralta. I think he's mm, at Princeton. Padilla Peralta. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think he's in the classics department. Uh, but he was, the title of the piece uh, was uh, Rachel Poser, who wrote a piece uh, about him in the New York Times. Uh, uh, he wanted to rid classics of whiteness or something right. like that. Right, right, right. Um, and I, I found that to be so incredible because he tells a moving story about being an immigrant and discovering the classics and realizing that basically his humanity, um, it, it spoke to him as a human being. Uh, but then he went on to, to talk about how marginalized uh, it, it, it makes people of color, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was a lot of, I felt like it was a lot of silliness. Um, because when you look at Ralph Ellison, when you look at Frederick Douglass, when you look at Richard Wright, when you look at, there's so many black figures, uh, Frank Snowden, I mentioned him, a classicist himself. But when you look at these individuals, what do they say? They say that Western civilization is powerful precisely because it civilizes. Now, when we think of civilized, we think of colonialism, all of that. But I'm, I'm saying civilized in the sense that it sort of raises our ability to engage in discourse, both psychologically and uh, morally, right? It teaches us to think appropriately and properly, and it helps us to uh, be 
the sorts of flourishing individuals we can be to the best of our ability. And so James Baldwin, you know, when he talks about the price of the ticket, he's speaking about that tradition in which we, we can reach a level of competence that will equip us to navigate the world, our communities, our families. And that's universal. That's not specific to a group of people. Frederick Douglass didn't say, you know, Western civilization belongs to white people or the founding documents or the principles of the founding, our founding documents belong to white people. He says they're universal. They apply to me just as much as they apply to um, um, white people, right? And so the, 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 what he learned from that Colombian orator, Douglas, this is, was that tradition. And so the, the Western philosophical tradition, not just the classical tradition, but the Western philosophical tradition has been key in terms of Black advancement both on the individual level and in terms of, of the group. And so when you hear those who argue, Black Americans, some Black Americans who argue that this tradition doesn't apply to us, then it's, it's absurd. As I point out, if any group is autochthonous in, 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 yeah. in, in America, it, it's, it's Black Americans. We've been here really since the beginning. And, and there's no other tradition that we can appeal to. Of course, we can admire other traditions, um, other African traditions, but I mean, that's not our tradition. Our tradition is here in this soil, on this land. And that tradition, that Western philosophical tradition, the classical tradition, um, is a key component, really the only component um, within um, the African-American tradition. That doesn't mean we, we can't have a canon. We certainly have a canon. Ralph Ellison, I mentioned uh, James Baldwin, et cetera. Um, but they first acknowledge, like Ralph Ellison does, that the particularities of the group and their experiences take place within a larger context. And that larger context is what helps us as artists, Ralph Ellison says, uh, articulate our particularity in a way that we wouldn't be able to. And so... Is African American um, the African American tradition separate from the Western philosophical tradition? Of course not. The classical tradition, of course not. It's part and parcel, and so we can emphasize certain things as a group because we've had unique experiences. But that doesn't that doesn't negate the fact that those unique experiences take place within a broader stream that unites all of us. And, and I take it back to the founding principles. And then of course, of course, ultimately that, that tradition, that Western philosophical tradition. So yeah, it's been very uh, influential, um, which, which I love. I mean, I love the ancients. Yeah. Yeah. You have a great quote from Frederick Douglass in your book where he compares um, the constitution and the country to a ship and a compass. The compass might point one way and the ship might go another way. But at the end of the day, you know, the compass is going to steer you correctly. Um, so I think it's, yeah, really, really beautiful interplay of why the Western tradition and why the Constitution are so important. Excellent. Um, and this has Thank been you. a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time. And the book will be linked in the show notes. So the listeners should absolutely check it out. Awesome. Well, thank you. And your, your questions were very insightful and I appreciate it. Thank you a lot. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Dr. Andre R.G. on his new book, The Virtue of Colorblindness, is linked in the show notes. Please do go ahead and check it out. If you enjoyed this episode, you can find out more about the Madison program and everything that we do here on Princeton University's campus at our website, jmp.princeton.edu. The semester has just started, so there you can find all of our upcoming events as well as all the recordings from our previous lectures. You can also sign up for our mailing list, and you can find us on social media, on Twitter, at Madison Program, as well as on Instagram and Facebook. Finally, if you enjoyed this episode, please do go ahead, leave us a rating, leave us a review. We really do appreciate it and can help us get better for the future. As always, we're so grateful that you tuned in to join us today, and we can't wait to see you next time here on Madison's Notes.